Yeah, welcome to this uh, digestive talk uh, just after lunch. Um, my name is Frederick Ram. Like most of you, probably, I have started OpenStreetMap as a hobby. Um, I'm still doing it as a hobby, but I'm also doing it for a living. And in this talk, I will tell you a little bit about the daily grind at uh, Geofabrik, which is um, my, my company that, that I'm running. Why am I doing this talk? Um, obviously, um, the commercial world has discovered OpenStreetMap, and OpenStreetMap is used by, by many people, by, by many businesses. Um, I want to encourage uh, responsible OSM consumption. I want people, I want commercial players who use OpenStreetMap to understand what OpenStreetMap is about, how the community works, and so on and so on. Um, the best way to get that, uh, to get that knowledge into, uh, uh, to transfer that knowledge to the end users is, in my opinion, if insiders act as, as a bridge, if people like me who know OpenStreetMap from the inside out and who have been doing it for a long time as a hobby um, are able to help these commercial people to, uh, to make the best of, of, of OSM and also make sure that what they do doesn't harm uh, the project or the community. So I really want to encourage more people to do what I'm doing to set up small businesses, businesses to work as freelancers maybe, to sell their OpenStreetMap expertise, to make a business, to make a living from, from their hobby. Now you might think that um, this is stupid of me because it creates more competition for me. And I then have to share with all the others. But I believe, and this is quite an old picture from an earlier talk, similar talk I did, I believe that a rising tide lifts all boats. So there's more than enough in this for anyone who wants to uh, give it a try and earn his money with OpenStreetMap. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about what Geofabric does. This is not intended to be a marketing talk. So when I say Geofabric does this and this and this, don't read this as a uh, uh, dear client, we will sell you the following. It's just basically to give you an idea of if you do business with OpenStreetMap, what can you expect? What, what's the market? What, what do people want to buy? And Geofabric is basically an all-around company where we on, on, on our web page it says here's our phone number call the experts if you have a question or if you want to buy something and this is what people want to buy um, um, about half of the business we do is uh, software development and data exports that's uh, the left half of the circle and then we do a little bit of server installing cartography stuff tile and WMS services and consulting and I'm going to go quickly over the uh, individual um, individual bits of that high. In software development, it's often someone comes and says, I want, to, I want to create a small website with a couple markers on them and then you should be able to click on the markers and something should pop up and whatever. It's often stuff that you can do mostly with existing technologies like open layers and stuff and then it requires maybe uh, a few simple tweaks to a library or a few pages. So these are not large development contracts that we're working on. It's more like uh, a couple of simple web pages or a small Rails application for someone. Um, it's not always specific to OSM. Uh, nowadays, sometimes people come to us and they have a very general question and they want to set up a, s a small application that does something and, and they would be happy to do that with Google Maps as well. Of course, we never sell them something that works with Google Maps. We always do stuff that works with OSM. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes there's the opportunity to actually make a client pay for an improvement to existing open source technology. So I had this in the past where someone uh, wanted extra features added to uh, OSM to PGSQL and, uh, and that led to myself making OSM to PGSQL 64-bit safe, stuff that I then committed to the uh, standard repositories for everyone to use. There are things like that. It's, it's, not, it's not very often, but uh, I try to, when, whenever I see an opportunity of taking a client's money to improve open source software, of course, that's a great thing. In data export, mostly shapefiles. People come and say, I would like to buy shapefiles for Britain or something. Um, sometimes it's quite fancy splitting. Sometimes people say, I would like to have shapefiles for the whole world, but in little squares of one by one uh, degree or something like that. Um, people want to have shape files that, that do not have the English names in them but or, or do not have certain local language in them but instead the English names or vice versa. Uh, often 
uh, if people have special requests, it takes uh, a lot of expertise to know what to export for them. Because someone says and says, c comes to me and says, I would like to export all, uh, all information relevant for mountaineering. And then I have to find out what, what the stuff is that, that they need and in how far it is present in OpenStreetMap. The worst thing is if, they, if the clients themselves use tag info, find an obscure tag uh, and they believe, oh, well, uh, OpenStreetMap has all so-and-so objects. Um, and then I have to tell them, well, yeah, this tag exists, but it's only used three times in the whole world and not in Austria, which you were interested in or something. So. Sometimes uh, someone requests a data export and what is needed is indeed uh, not a plain export, but you, first you have to write a bit of code. For example, we often have people who want all populated areas or residential areas in a country and uh, OpenStreetMap re land use equals residential isn't quite complete. There are some places where you have lots and lots of towns and cities mapped, but no single land use residential. So what we then do is uh, we come up with something that looks at, res at the density of residential roads and constructs areas from that or something. So that's sometimes also required. Um, sometimes people ask for a data export and it turns out that they need something completely different. For example, we have people asking, uh, can I have an export of all the addresses in OpenStreetMap to load them in my MS SQL server so that I can set up geocoding? And what we would then typically say is, uh, uh, we should maybe rather install a nominatum server for you instead of having you install all that stuff. Server installs, we do, we install tile servers for people, we install nominatum servers, routing servers, overpass servers, all that has happened in the past. Servers doing all of the above. Um, directions for all of this are obviously on the wiki, and if you have a little bit of experience with Linux and, and compiling or setting up software, sometimes it's only required to install the, the required packages. Um, and we tell people so. If someone comes to me and says, I would like a tile server, then I tell them, yeah, well, the instructions for that are on switch2osm.org, and you can do it yourself. We can also do it for you. That costs two days of work or something. And there are sp some people who say, oh, well, thank you. I'm going to try my hand at this myself. And others who say, you know, I don't have the time to, to, to do that. Please, could you set this up for us? And, and I think that's a very... That's a very honest business model because I don't lie to people. I don't tell them, yeah, tile servers are only available for us, from us, or we have the better tile servers. We just do the tender, standard tile server that anyone else could install as well, but we have some experience and, and we can help you uh, find the right hardware to, to use and so on. Um, no two installs are the same. Uh, it would be nice if I could just go by the book and uh, or run a script, run a chef script that would install any tile server, but um, the, the situation is always a little bit difficult, different areas, different hardware, and so on. We have Tile and WMS services. That's the, the one product at Geofabric that is very standardized. Um, it's a, just a standard Tile server that, that people can use and that, that we operate also for the, for the WMS server um, for, for a monthly, monthly fee. Uh, standard OpenStreetMap tiles, really. Uh, and just, just as I said before, if someone comes to me and says, I would like to use uh, OSM tiles for my hobby project, then I will tell them, if your hobby project doesn't use too much bandwidth, you can just use the normal OpenStreetMap tiles, so no need to buy something from us. And if someone says, well, this is a commercial thing and I want to make more traffic, then they, we, we sell them something. It is nice because it's a regular income and, and it's something that you can plan ahead. You know, if you have a number of subscriptions, people will pay regularly. Um, on the other hand, it requires server administration, which, which means that uh, at any one time someone has to be on, on call and, and be able to repair a server if, if required or set up a new one and so on. Um, that's also a bit stressful. Um, WMS is quite interesting because WMS is an old-fashioned GIS technology that we don't deal much in, with in OpenStreetMap, but it's still used very often in the GIS world. So um, it's, it's a kind of gateway thing because we offer this WMS service. Um, people often uh, search for that, who, can, who sells WMS services for OpenStreetMap, then they come to us. And then it later turns out that they really want a tile server and not a WMS, but they didn't even know what a tile server was and they needed us to explain that to them. Which brings us to consulting. Um, we are often contacted by people who have a certain project in mind and want to know, can I use OpenStreetMap for that? W is OpenStreetMap good enough? Will it work? Is the license okay? Um, or we have people who have very concrete things, who have maybe followed the uh, instructions and set up their own tile server and are now wondering why it is so slow. And then 
uh, they call me on the phone and what I usually do is I, I, I say, you know, the first half hour is free on the phone and I'll talk to you and I'll tell you what things to look out for. And then if you need more, if you want me to log into your machine and, and, and check it out, then uh, you have to pay for the additional time. Um, it is sometimes difficult to separate consulting from a sales call. Sometimes people say, we would like to use OpenStreetMap in our business and this is going to be real big and we would like you to come to our place and discuss this for half a day or something. And, and they expect me to come to them for free and discuss their project because there might be a sale down the line. And many big businesses will do that. If, if you are a big business and if you call Esri and say, we are thinking of buying your uh, $2 million technology, could you please uh, send a couple of uh, salespeople to us and uh, make a nice slideshow? They will do that for free. I don't. Um, if people want me to come to their place and discuss something, they have to pay. Um, if they want to come to my office and, and, and have a coffee and chat, that's okay. And I will, I'm, I'm usually, I'll, I'll not charge them for talking to me for an hour or so, but, but then anything <coughs> above that costs money. Now, the stuff that I've just talked, been talking about is what it takes up basically these paid jobs that we do take up about half of my working time. The other time uh, uh, at Geofabric, I do stuff that I don't get any money for, uh, community interaction. I read lots of mailing lists. I participate in lots of discussion forums. Um, because it's, it's also important for my business stuff, I have to know what's going on. I have to know what people are up to and so on. Otherwise, I can't offer valuable consulting to, uh, to third parties. Um, we, do, we print lots of posters, we, we do flyers and send them out to the community when, when someone in the community um, has uh, a, a trade fair somewhere and they want to put up an OSM poster, we do that for free. We have lots of telephone calls from all sorts of random people who um, basically, if, if, if you're a 65-year-old Garmin user, and you're struggling with installing OSM on your Garmin uh, device and you can't really use mailing lists or forums and you try to find out a telephone number, the OSM telephone number that you could call. Uh, for some reason, people often end up with finding our telephone number and then, um, and then I, I'll try to help them as good as I can if it doesn't take, uh, take up too much time, I try to send them to the right places. But there's often lots of people who don't really, who are private, private individuals who really want to know something about OpenStreetMap or who, who are stumped with something. And, uh, and, and, and you know, I, I tell them that, that we are, uh, Geofabric is a commercial consulting company and I can't really talk to them at length, but I'm, I'm willing to spend a little bit of time with them, try to help them. Um, also, of course, we do the download server that I've talked about yesterday and, and um, other similar stuff that takes up time. Now, for some of the downsides of this job, it's obviously quite nice to, to be able to do stuff that's your hobby, um, but there are also downsides. Uh, one of them is, is the, con the steady constant switching. That's my, my initial business partner, whom I set Geofabric up with, Jochen, um, has left because he didn't, um, he, he didn't like to be uh, the, the CEO of the place where he had, ha he had, had to he had to take phone calls all the time and be, uh, be distracted by lots of different projects at the same time. He said, I'm, I'm someone who wants to work on a project continuously for a number of weeks in, in a row. And that's something that, that is very difficult at Geofabric. I have to, at any one time, I'm working at, at, at five or ten projects at the same time. Because it's a small, it's a small shop, it's just... Uh, it's just uh, two full-time people and a couple of spare time, a uh, couple of, of part-time people. So, um, yeah. Um, paperwork uh, isn't a lot of fun. Occasionally, we have people who don't just buy something, but they want to have a 10-page tender document or offer or something. And occasionally, we, we actually do that. Uh, but it's, it's often tedious and, uh, and doesn't often lead to, to the desired results. SLAs, uh, people asking us, hey, what, what, what guarantees can you offer for your tile server? How, man, how, how many nines uh, beyond the, the decimal point can you offer in your availability and stuff? That's, um, that, that, that's a difficult thing. And if, if someone wants that kind of, uh, of reliability, then I often send them away and say, you have to talk to a professional, um, um, prof professional computer operating uh, company and, and not to us. 
Um, one thing that I don't like, and that's often very hard, um, explaining to, to would-be customers why small things are, di are so difficult. People come and say, but it can't be too hard to do, <laughs> and then you say, yeah, with OpenStreetMap data and with the things, way things currently are, this is going to take me a week to implement that for you and cost you like 5,000 euros or something, and then people say, whoa, didn't know that OpenStreetMap was so expensive. And so that's, that's sometimes, th there are sometimes questions where I, even I feel they should be, they should have an easy answer, but they don't. And, uh, and it hurts to be expensive. It's, it's often, I, I have often people asking for, um, it, it, it I have often have people asking for uh, 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 programming jobs for really, really interesting tasks. People have interesting ideas about a small website they want to set up, um, and uh, and I have a look at it and I say, yeah, that can be done, but it's you know it's gonna cost like be ten days of work or something. And I would really like to do that. It's an interesting thing. Uh, if it were my idea and I would be coding it as a hobby, I would probably just do it and, and try it out, but I can't, I can't follow all these interesting leads. So that's, that's sometimes it's a bit sad uh, to, uh, to have to tell people, you know, it's really interesting, but I can't, uh, I can't do it if you don't pay me for so and so much work. Um, products versus services, very quick. Um, what we essentially do, Geofabric is a, is a service company. Uh, we can't, we can't get rich quick, we can't attract venture capital, we can't get bought by Google because we, it's, not, it's not that we're investing a lot of money into a great product and then we have this great product which is suddenly bought by millions of people and we rule the world. We're just a small a service company, people come to us, we do something for them, we basically rent out our heads to them and uh, we can grow but we can only grow slowly and that's okay for us. Um, however, um, having at least some pro product, and in our case that would be the tile servers or the download server, um, some kind of standardized service makes things easier because it can be used by people uh, to start a conversation. Like I said before, we have the WMS server. People are looking for someone to provide um, WMS and then you get into a conversation and you find out that people uh, need something very different from a WMS. So that often having some kind of, of product, and that's also a recommendation if you want to set up some kind of business, try to, s try to have something to say, this is our map, the, the map that only my company does or this is the kind of service that we offer so um, I think that really helps. Thank you for your attention. Um, that was my talk about Geofabric and I have now, um, I'm, I would like to give the final five minutes of this talk to Andy Allen who is in a very similar to position to me in some ways because he's also running a small OpenStreetMap business in the UK. Thank you. Just get the slides. Yeah, so actually listening to Frederick's talk, um, it kind of eats into most of my points because it turns out we're doing very similar things, just completely separately. I started doing um, OpenStreetMap as a as a full time job for a startup um, about six years ago, but three years ago I left and and set up on my own because uh, I had my own ideas about what I wanted to do. I, instead of telling what I do. I'm going to give a quick guide for anybody in the audience who is perhaps thinking about setting up on their own. Maybe you don't like your current job and you want to go and do your own thing or, or that, or, you know, fancy something new. So I'm just briefly going to touch on what my guide is to freelancing products and technology for the kind of, like me and Frederick, the kind of person who wants to do OpenStreetMap but do it on their own terms by themselves. So for me, the joys of freelancing is that it's a great way to build contacts with people. You get to talk to a lot of different companies, talk to 20, 30 companies a year. Um, I don't come from a GIS background, so I don't really understand what most traditional companies, what their um, pain points are and how we could uh, fix it for them. But um, freelancing is a, is a much better way of doing this than just having a product because if I build the wrong product, nobody will want it and nobody will come and talk to me to explain what the problem is. So freelancing is great from there. It's quick money and I mean like you can do some work one day and send them the invoice the next day and it might take a month until they bother paying it. Um, but it's completely different from working for three months on setting something up. You don't have to fund yourself in any way. 
um, in any similar level as uh, if you're freelancing. And the final point, um, which took, took me a surprisingly long time to learn, is charge more than you're comfortable with. If you're a kind of techie guy and someone comes along to you and says, as Frederick was talking about earlier, can you set me up a tile server? I think, yeah, sure, I can set you up a tile server. Um, it's not going to take me that long. I'll, I'll just charge you for a couple of hours work. Um, but that's, that's a really great way to spend all your time answering emails and doing work and not earning any income. Um, just realize that companies, the way that companies spend their money is entirely different from the way that you as a techie think about money. For them, it's all about time and it's about resources. And if, um, if you can take care of something for them, they're willing to pay a much higher rate than I would be willing to pay if I was like, oh, I'm busy today. Can I get my mate to do it? I, I, so charge more than you're comfortable with. Um, you'll quickly find out if you're charging more than you're worth because you won't get any more business. Products on the flip side, um, you know, are, are a different approach. They have some advantages. You get to choose what you want to work on. Like it, it's not a great month if all your freelancing customers come in and give you boring jobs to do. It's, it's not very exciting. So you get to choose what you want to work on, presumably things you enjoy doing. You get to capture more of the value out of what you're doing. A, a lot of the work, a lot of the freelance work I do is kind of just routine stuff, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward. But sometimes I solve a problem in a really awesome way and like it works and it's brilliant and then that was it because I only said it would take me two days and, and that's how much they paid me for it. So when you build your own stuff, if it's really cool, um, then you still own it. For me, it's always recurring income, that's the goal. Um, it, like I've got recurring expenses, my rent doesn't go up and down every month. So being able to get some predictability about income um, is really important. And it's easier to do that with a product where you're charging companies every month than it is trying every month to line up enough freelancing clients to, to fill in all the gaps. And when you've been doing this for a while, you start to be able to sell your byproducts. And that's where like, I'm well known for making open cycle map and making a transport layer and I had to build all the infrastructure in order to be able to host these and monitor them and keep them up and all, all the rest of it. And now uh, as one of my products I can host map styles for other people because I've already done that infrastructure work. Um, it's, it's something that I can sell as a byproduct. And the downside of products is that it's much longer until you see a return. Um, you can't just send an invoice on the first day, like you can't sit down and do a day's work of coding an in invoice someday. It might be months before you see any money coming in. Um, and you can waste a lot of time building cool things. Uh, if, if you're working for yourself and you're a techie and you're doing something technological, um, you can decide that it's the most important thing in the world to take advantage of Mapnik 2.2 release with the you know, sub-pixel halo f um, around the fonts. Just Bear in mind you need to charge somebody some money for all the, all the work that you're doing. From technology, automate the everythings. If you're an individual person, you cannot spend your time logging into servers and, and changing stuff. Just concentrate on make sure everything's in Git, that you're using Chef to provision servers, you're using Vagrant to test your Chef, then things like that. Try and minimize the amount of moving parts. If you want inspiration, um, look at what the Mapbox guys do. They're very into static everything, cacheable this, all, all the rest of it. Um, it's really important because, again, you don't want to get that phone call at two or the, the ping them alert at 2 o'clock in the morning saying something stopped working. So try and minimize the amount of moving parts in anything you're doing. And don't worry about scaling too much because um, the chances are if you're just a small guy, you're not going to have any scaling problems. You're going to put something up, have a few customers, make some money, and that's the end of it. So you don't need to architect everything in the cloud. It doesn't all need to be EC2, this, and, and uh, so on. Overall, the mo most important thing if you're setting out is to try and find your own comfort balance between the amount of freelancing you want to do and the amount of product development you want to do. I do about 50-50 now. I started 100% freelancing, and I'm, I'm continuing to aim doing more products. But I know a lot of people who have no interest in running uh, the product side, and they really want to do freelancing. I know a lot of people who have spent a lot of money building products when they should have been doing some freelance work. Try and focus on increasing your income. Um, and what goes with that is accept the costs of business. 
like don't worry that PayPal charges 3.7% on every transaction and you can get a 3.6% deal somewhere else. Just try and double the number of customers you've got and you'll make, a, you make life so much easier for yourself. And I would reflect what Frederick said. It's hard, but it's entirely possible to earn your living from OpenStreetMap. That's it from me. Any questions to any of us? Again? You mean you mean the the total amount of people doing OSM consulting business? Um, hard hard to say. I would say that um, there might be a handful of people, maybe maybe ten, maybe a dozen. Uh, who do something like we do in 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 larger or smaller you know may, maybe it's sometimes it's organizations who have ten employees but they don't all do OpenStreetMap so uh, is I don't think it's too big. I, I would say that it's not really the size of it at the moment; it's the potential size of it. So if you go to an Esri con conference and there's fifteen thousand people there and there's consultants crawling everywhere, there's an opportunity to take business off of every single one of those consultants. So, like, do you have any idea how, uh, what was the potential? You're right now covering like one percent of the demand or ten percent. Personally, I don't have a gut feeling how much uh, we're we're covering at the moment. Same, same, same here. We're just basically running along, doing our thing, and uh, you know, it's. Uh, I think that uh, if if we were to, if if we really really wanted to aggressively grow, um, we could hire a couple of people and and just push our services out. However. Um, the, the way that Geofabric does marketing is basically we listen for the phone to ring. Um, and, and it works, and it's very nice that it works, because I don't like doing marketing. I don't like pushing stuff down people's throats. So um, it's, it's okay for me a, as, a, as a way of doing business. It might not be the, 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 the way that maximizes the outcome, but uh, it's very nice. Yeah. Yeah, the question is how how do people find us? I think that uh, for for both Andy and myself, it's we we do have considerable exposure through the things that we do and and offer for free. For for Andy, it's the it's the Open Cycle Map, and so he's he's well known for that. Um, for for Geofabric, it's probably the download server that we do, um, and, and that's why many people, even in the community, if someone in some forum asks the question, uh, "Where can I find so and so?" people will actively point them to Andy or to myself or to to other people. So so that works quite well. That's why I had this one slide where I said it, it's good to have a product. Uh, even if that's a free product, because it, it will at least give people a, a point of contact or make you make you known for something. Yeah. Okay, uh, for, 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 me, for me the situation is that um, I believe that people like, like Mapbox will take more and more of the, of the low-hanging fruit, like uh, people who just want to buy tiles somewhere or so. Um, they do have uh, other options right now. I mean, the, the CloudMate has been, has been doing that for uh, five years ago or something. Um, and, and we still sold tiles to some people and we will continue to sell tiles to some people. But I think there will be certain, uh, certain easy to do areas that, that, that will continuously be, or will continue to be taken over by, by other players. Uh, 
forcing us into into uh, something uh, into more niche things you know offering a special kind of styles that because of their technology mapbox maybe cannot easily offer or offering w whatever different kinds of services and there's because we're not so big it's it's, it's not like i have 20 employees who I'm, whom i have to retrain uh, on the next niche uh, and so so we are flexible enough to to adapt to changing conditions so i'm not so worried about that I would say the other thing is um, because we're in a, in a rapidly growing market, you know, OpenStreetMap is, is rapidly growing. Even if someone came along and took half of my business away from me, the chances are my business would still be bigger next year because there's way more interest in OpenStreetMap. So I expect to, like, as time goes on, each thing that I do will perhaps be a smaller percentage of the overall market, but that's, that's not really a problem. Um, I, I occasionally have uh, clients who do stuff in the, in the, for example, in the routing, uh, routing business, do, doing uh, network analysis and stuff uh, with OpenStreetMap data and asking Geofabric to prepare uh, specialized extracts for that. Um, other than that, uh, I, don't, uh, I, I don't recollect uh, uh, an, anyone asking for that kind of, of thing. Yeah, we need to, to stop now. Next, uh, next presentation is up. Um, catch us in the breaks if you have any more questions. Thank you.